Good afternoon. Welcome to the press conference dedicated to various initiatives with mutual help, mutual aid funds and other initiatives. I will introduce the speakers of the day. Uh, they are Andrei Strizak, the co-founder of BY Help and BY Soul by Soul Mutual Aid Fund. Yeah, добрый день. Техника наконец-то позволила мне присоединиться к встрече. Yes, finally my equipment uh, ended its its revolt, and I'm I'm here with you. Okay, uh, we have Alexey Leonchik, another co-founder of BY Help and BY Soul. Alexey, good to hear you. Alexey, yes, I am there. I can hear you. Okay, great. Yelena Zhivaglot, leader of the Honest People Initiative. Good afternoon. Olga Smolenko, lawyer and director of the Center for Legal Transformation, Latrand. Good afternoon. My name is Smolenko. Uh, Center for Legal Transformation is the, is the name of my organization, Latrand. And we have Vlad Kobitz, Center of the Belarusian Solidarity. We're expecting him to join us in the coming minutes. I would like to ask our dear participants, our journalists, to ask your questions in the group chat in Zoom. Alternatively, you can also use the group chat in Zoom to ask the floor, in which case we will enable your microphone and or camera, and you'll be able to uh, ask your question in person. I would also like to remind you that there is simultaneous interpretation in process uh, for non-Russian speakers, non-Belarusian speakers. Please make sure you press the globe icon. I'm typing this instruction as we speak. And uh, just another request, uh, those of you joining us, uh, please rename yourselves to match the following format, name, last name, and the media, media outfit or agency that you represent. In this case, we'll be able to properly communicate this uh, information to the speakers whenever we're voicing your question. Thank you very much indeed for your cooperation. Right, so as far as I'm aware, our speakers have a brief introductory address, each of them. So uh, let us take turns, or let us give them the floor, taking turns. Andrei, Alexei, uh, so whoever's willing to take the floor, co-founders of By Help and By Soul. Okay, <laughs> yes, I just wanted to suggest that you take the floor. Uh, you mean bastard. Right, so I am a bit, uh, it's, it's a bit windy out here, so it's just, uh, if I'm forgetting something, it's, it's, it's uh, just a windy atmosphere around. Right, I can just uh, briefly talk about what we have at this point. I will talk about my help, and Andre would be the best go-to person to talk about by soul. By help, and well, me and Alexei, we have both uh, founded this uh, mutual aid funds. So we're public figures. So we launched these, but we administrate uh, Andre runs uh, by soul, I run by help. So questions and answers, daily operation, and so on and so forth. So you, well, Andre would be this the person to talk about that. So we coordinate among ourselves, uh, but uh, well, anyway, my colleague is, by help was established in 2017. This is the third fundraising campaign. $3.62 million have been raised by this initiative. The payouts have been made to more than 2,000. I'm giving you very brief, 2,000 people must have been then. This is the update, that the data of the last Saturday. So whatever people will find because of the because of their protests or just just because they were found or found guilty of illicit actions, uh, or allegedly illicit actions, so the law enforcement took them in. We helped them pay fines. We're also sharing the information with other organizations and 
we, oh, the sound is quite distorted. Around 9,000 applications uh, have been submitted. 70, 100 uh, applications arrive every day. And unlikely uh, this number is going to diminish because of the last events, because of the most recent events, the arrests, uh, the detentions are still going on. I'm also a finder. Me, by help and by soul, are. Apart from that, we're also we've also launched an initiative for relocation. With this respect, we uh, operate, uh, we cooperate in Poland with the Center for Belarusian Solidarity. Andrei can talk about that. Uh, the money pool is shared for all. I mean, everything that we have collected goes into one bucket and it goes to whichever initiative helping co cooperating with uh, Polish partners, Ukrainian partners, Latvian partners. I focus on Poland. Uh, so this is just my brief introduction. I will leave the opportunity for you to ask questions. Andrei, over to you. Да, спасибо, Леша, за то, что взял на себя львиную yes, часть you, работы, которая надо было в последнее время у нас есть такая внутренняя шутка, что фонды не работают, так вот, на самом деле работают. Причем, выглядит это так, что если смотреть на количество заявок, которые вообще смотрят, то тем более 2000 человек, о которых говорил Алексей, нужно добавить еще 756 человек, которые подались в фонд Байсол. В общей сложности за время существования фонда мы выплатили 1 366 тысяч евро для компенсации по следующим принципам. Если человек был уволен по политическим причинам, решил оставить свою службу либо работу в госсекторе в связи с несогласием с действиями властей, и третья категория, которой мы помогаем, это организованные забастовочные комитеты. На данный момент 12 по всей стране, с которыми мы сотрудничаем. С Топичком мы работаем совместно с инициативой «Честные люди», про это, я думаю, Елена больше расскажет. Мы на данный момент получили где-то около 2000 заявок. В среднем день поступает около 30 заявок после объявления на Очень усилий репрессии и отдельная категория, которая сейчас репрессирует, которую Байсол тоже взял под опеку, это студенты. Если говорить о суммах выплат, то у нас они составляют полторы по политическим причинам, это единоразовая выплата, и 200 евро по отчислению. Студентов мы только-только начали брать в работу, сейчас мы сделали первые 8 выплат вчера. Это я впервые это говорю публично, потому что еще еще не было статистики на вчерашний день. И в целом выглядит это так, что власть понимает, что конечно, каким-то образом противодействовать, но и в Байхелп, и в Байсоле система платежей и завода денег в Беларусь настроена таким образом, что в принципе я не представляю себе, каким образом власть может ее обрезать и ограничить. Они будут вынуждены стрелять себе даже не в ногу, а в голову, потому что, например, система выплат by soul, если говорить в целом, очень плотно завязана на платежной системе Visa и MasterCard, для того, чтобы прекратить эти платежи, нужно просто отрубить и визу и MasterCard. Как бы такое короткое вводное слово, я готов отвечать на вопросы, ears to spot the nose, to spy the face, they will have to shoot them in the head, themselves in the head. Okay, thank you, Andrei. Uh, Elena. Jovaglot, leader of the Honest People Initiative, a brief intro from you. Right, hello. I'll talk about uh, the initiative. It's not really a fund. Uh, like Andre said, in, in some projects and some initiatives, we cooperate with the funds, but we are not a fund ourselves. The key bit that we do is prompt assistance. It was created to render assistance to the Belarusians that lost their jobs because of their civil stance, because of their political views. The project started in July this year, still lives on. This is a person-to-person -person, uh, platform where people get to know each other. 
and they render financial assistance to each other. So there are no intermediaries there. The money is transferred peer to peer. The lots and the applicants uh, that provided their applications, that submitted their applications, uh, are verified. Uh, the, ge the genuine nature uh, the, of these applications is verified that the people have indeed been fired, lost their jobs, and they are paid a triple minimal uh, wages rate. As Belarusians are gathering this amount uh, declared on the website. Now, for the figures throughout the time of the platform's operation, we have rendered assistance uh, to slightly less than 1.35 million Belarusian rubles, something. And this is the amount of help rendered to date. And now we have some areas uh, before the Belarusians. These are the stories that are still pending. Uh, the fundraising is still to be collected, is still to be raised. Uh, the Belarusians uh, visit the website, they read these stories, and they donate money. So daily, raise, uh, the daily we received 10 to 12, uh, 9 to 12 cases, Belarusians that suffered because of their political views. The statistics is growing, same as Andrei said, uh, we are exper experiencing a rising trend. A similar situation. Just briefly about the essence of the platform, how it works financially. This mutual aid initiative helps Belarusians seek for jobs and retrain, get retraining. Right, so these are some local things that are not particularly interesting. And the project where Honest People Initiative is the organizer of help and the intermediary, the, uh, it's the Honest University project where we help students live through these turbulent times. It's legal assistance that we render, organizational help, financial assistance, uh, search for international educational programs. And we help them meet uh, the funds uh, uh, that Andre has mentioned. We help them apply there. And there's a project uh, center for help to the people on strike. The process is a bit different. Andre has also briefly mentioned that I don't think I should reiterate that it's essentially strike organization committee. We interact with those. So that's a, that's every, everything there is uh, where we come in touch with these topics, with the declared topics. Thank you, Elena. Now I'd like to pass the floor to Olga Smolyanka. Right. So good afternoon. I'm a lawyer myself. I specialized as a lawyer uh, on charity and financial activity. The organizers of the press conference asked me to say a few words about why it is complicated for these funds to operate in Belarus. Why it is a challenge to operate in Belarus? Why it is challenging to raise funds uh, for foundations in Belarus? I'll talk briefly about these issues and uh, should there be any questions my way, I'll definitely take them. I would single out four key issues why the operation of this foundation, the fundraising for these foundations is difficult, why they have to do it and they, well, they, they're not supposed to do it, they do it primarily overseas, abroad. The first issue is the issue of establishing a foundation. The thing is, if we're talking about the foundations that need to be created promptly for some prompt needs, as in rendering assistance to citizens you know, with new objectives. Establishing a fund is very complicated because it's permission-based. The, the registration system is permission-based. You're supposed to get a permission from it. Uh, it's a long-term process, it's costly, and it's problematic from the viewpoint of paperwork that needs to be collected. And then it's also problematic because the foundations that are applied for registration, the, the foundations, I'm just referring to them, civil society organizations, foundations, funds, uh, whichever name you pin on them, uh, you never know whether your application is going to be satisfied or not. It's going to be. The second issue is within the legislation on charity that exists in Belarus. First of all, Belarus has no legislation in force uh, that will uh, do, dwell with the charity matters. That's for starters. Secondly, as of 2001, the Belarusian authorities introduced a system where they limited uh, the access 
of non-profit organizations to funding. As of 2001, uh, raising funds in Belarus to any organization was uh, pretty much uh, very easy until until 2001. However, as of 2001, the things have gotten tighter and tighter, and now we have the system in place uh, that we do. It's uh, virtually impossible to raise funds in Belarus. The foundations in Belarus can only raise funds more or less easily uh, from the, from permanent residents of Belarus. Now we see that uh, the role of Belarusian diaspora has grown significantly, rendering assistance uh, to people who have suffered, who have been the victim, uh, victims, who have been fired, or who left the jobs themselves. The thing is, if the Belarusian, if the funds registered in Belarus were to receive uh, the monies from Belarusian citizens that live abroad, all these funds, uh, in any amount, uh, they would have had would have had to be registered at the Department for Humanitarian Activity. And there's another problem out here. Registration of this help is a very complicated and very lengthy bureaucratized process, having this aid registered. Secondly, you never know whether, you, whether again, uh, the aid that you're registering is going to be registered or not. Will it be exempt from taxes or not? You never know that either in advance. And uh, there's also a lot of limits uh, from internal uh, donators, uh, donors uh, from companies, from legal entities in the territory of Belarus. There's a strict limit on that. Law enforcement is a third problem. I've already mentioned that the legislation is very restrictive. At the same time, uh, there are restrictive frameworks, but the government does not regulate technical aspects uh, related to receiving the aid. In this case, the law enforcement has a very broad uh, field for maneuver to interpret uh, the legislation the way they see fit. And in case there are checkups, in case there are insp inspections, and in many cases, organizations that are received, that are the beneficiaries of aid, uh, they receive queries uh, from the Department for Financial Investigations, from the uh, Department of Police fighting economic crimes, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, there, there are queries on the part of these two institutions to beneficiaries of aid as to where the funds came from. And the law enforcement can go uh, this way. The financial activity is so, uh, on the one hand, it's restrictive. There's, there's restrictive legislation. And on the, on the other hand, uh, there's lack of legislation uh, and free interpretation. And for this reason, uh, any fund uh, that is uh, disbursing money in Belarus, uh, well, there will be a way to pick on them. And thirdly, or fourthly, Belarus, the Belarusian authorities were not particularly interested in developing charity in the country. And these days, uh, when this charity is uh, channeled to the victims, uh, this reluctance of the government to develop the charity organizations is even smaller. I'll give just one, one uh, small example why Belarus is not, well, the Belarusian authorities are not eager to develop charity. Back in the day, there was a single draft law that was uh, 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 that was approved by the parliament, but not signed by the president. It was uh, the draft law on charity and char charitable activities, char charitable organizations. And secondly, there was an initiative that we observe right now. The so-called authorities, they try to discredit these funds in any way possible. They use every means, every way to try to discredit the organizations that raise funds and surrender help. We've seen uh, the press secretary of the president's uh, badmouth, Andrei Strizhak. We've heard her badmouth, Ekaterina Semyuk, uh, this is a people's names. And well, there are multiple examples uh, of this nature. So this is the status quo as to the issues in law enforcement uh, as to charity these days. Right, thank you very much. Thank you, Olga. We have Vlad Kobitz joining us. He represents the Center for Belarusian Solidarity. Vlad, hello. Vlad, could you could you please briefly elaborate on, uh, on the activities of the Fund for Belarusian Solidarity? Vlad, Vlad, first to Vlad. Doesn't Vlad, doesn't seem that way. Oh, Vlad, we cannot hear you. Uh, please unmute your mic if you have muted it. We cannot hear if you're saying anything. Yes, we see Vlad, but uh, there's no there's no incoming sound. Uh, 
Ну, к сожалению, да, к сожалению, нет пока что звука от Влада. Yeah, okay. I just disconnected the headphones. It's much better. Yes, thank you. The Fund for Belarusian Solidarity opened in Warsaw in September, on September the 1st. And because of the events in Belarus and because of the Belarusians flowing to Belarus, uh, flowing to Poland from Belarus, because of the reprisals against them in Belarus, uh, 14 entities, 14 organizations uh, acting in Belarus, in, Czech Repu in Poland, in Czech Republic, in the UK, they have initiated the creation of the Center for the Belarusian, for, of, of the Belarusian Solidarity. Many of them have had experience uh, of, say, work in, uh, in, after the events of 2010, particularly us, we had this experience. And uh, having been dealing with other matters, other directions over this uh, decade, we decided to bring our efforts together, bring our expertise together to that end, to, end, to render decent, meaningful assistance legal advisory financial service to Belarusians that were forced uh, to leave the country. Literally today, the fund finally got its own premises. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here as we speak. It's right here. Uh, this uh, premise, These premises will belong to the foundation. Uh, we will operate uh, from the new address. Uh, we're a Polish organization headquartered in Poland. We do not have issues that Belarusian fundraisers uh, face. I mean, the mentioned legal restrictions and various obstacles that the government throw away. We do not render the assistance within Belarus. We render aid, we provide aid to those who have relocated, uh, who have already moved or who are about to move. In this respect, we definitely cooperate with BISOL, with, with BiHelp. We also closely cooperate with uh, IMENA, with the Names Foundation. And this uh, helps us verify people very quickly. Those uh, people who have been vetted, who have been cer uh, certified by IMENA or by other organizations, uh, they are received by us. Uh, mm. These cases are simply transferred to us. And the person that is coming from Belarus receives advisory information right there. We have the helpline operating. We have a Telegram channel on Facebook. A person, an applicant, receives the information about the rules of entry to the country. Very few people know at this point that uh, you can uh, go into Poland uh, without any visa. If, uh, if there is uh, the Polish government's instruction uh, about the humanitarian corridor to be opened, uh, a person who is uh, who has crossed Belarusian border and accesses Polish border, uh, they can be given uh, 14 days uh, of stay in Poland. Uh, 10 days is quarantine. Uh, the government provides meals and accommodation for this time frame. Uh, in medical cases, in case of necessity, especially when the medical assistance is required, we go to the border, we pick up that person, we uh, accommodate them in Warsaw in other in, uh, or a different city of Poland on our premises, and we try to uh, render every help possible right there immediately. Over this time, when we've been up and running, we have had more than 650 applications. We've received over 650 applications. The assistance rendered is provided from the funds that we raise by rank and file people, by common people. PayPal accounts, our bank account uh, is used uh, to receive this money. And we also cooperate with the funds that I've mentioned. Uh, when people call our hotline, they uh, have a contact with lawyer, depending on the severity of the case, or depending on the case, uh, as a specific lawyer talks to them. If there are people who are asylum, seeker, asylum seekers, uh, they are advised as to the rights that uh, they're entitled to. If these are students who have been expelled, and the sound and video feed has frozen, Nope, it's a, it's a global issue, yes, Vlad, Vlad's uh, uplink is gone. Okay, back again. So every person that requires assistance, logistical assistance, uh, a volunteer is assigned. There is a list of volunteers that, have, that can help these people in need. 
These volunteers uh, take care of these people. If, for example, there is a need to uh, to appeal or to go to any uh, government uh, governmental institution, this is related to legalization. People with working visas uh, are granted work permits. After visits of Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, and because of the will uh, that the government, the Polish government, is showing political will to help Belarusians, many issues have been resolved. In particularly, uh, in particular, on 28th of October, the, the parliament voted on the law to change the visa legislation on foreigners, basically. And uh, November the 2nd, uh, Andrei Duda, the president, signed it. Uh, 14 days after publication, this law uh, is enforced. And the Belarusians that entered after that time on tourist or humanitarian visas, they will, uh, they will be able to get work permits. Definitely, uh, there is the uh, work permit uh, procedure to be obtained. But this is a bureaucratic procedure which is not particularly challenging. What else we operate with? Uh, we have a logistical network, uh, premises that have been granted to us by rank and file Polish people, uh, either for free or some discounted rate or just for the utility bills to, to be covered. Uh, we use these premises, these uh, accommodation spaces, to put up people uh, that are looking forward to, to, for this law to be finally enacted. Uh, people who came here after September, Grodna Azot, Minsk tractor plants, uh, strike committees, uh, they are awaiting for that law to be uh, entered into force and uh, after which they will be able to get work permits. So they are housed uh, on our accommodation premises. Uh, we give them meals and we provide meals to them. Mm. If people apply to us and didn't uh, get help and, and buy so or buy help, uh, they did not receive aid. Uh, Well, these people will be uh, provided with accommodation and then our experts uh, help them find employment. We contact employers, there, there are uh, this feedback, Belarusians are welcome to work here, uh, the Belarusians are very valued in the uh, workforce, uh, in the work, uh, in the labor market. Uh, and uh, particularly there is, there is an interest uh, to employ Belarusians uh, who have been victimized uh, by these events in the country, in Belarus. Uh, the visit of Svetlana Tikhanovskaya also, uh, she, met, she, she met the Prime Minister, uh, she submitted a number of points prepared by our legal department uh, in cooperation with her headquarters. Uh, these are the uh, simplification of procedures, uh, suggestions for Belarusians, for the Belarusians. Uh, after that, uh, the task forces were created in Warsaw, particularly in a number of other countries. Uh, so education, employment, and social issues, uh, they are taken care of by these uh, task forces. Uh, NGOs and governmental organizations are involved there. The first task force is dedicated to children, if there are school children, uh, of high school age, inclusive. Uh, workforce uh, task forces, well, employment task force is clear, it's uh, employment, and the social issues or social matters is, is uh, any problems that Belarusians face. So the state level and municipal level is already working with this issue. What else uh, can we add? Our center is a young organization, although it is built of the entities uh, that are experienced uh, in this uh, nature of work, in this line of work. The interaction with BISOL, with the IMENA Fund, it helps us uh, uh, grant help uh, around the country. Ukraine, Latvia, Lithuania, uh, people who are in refugee camps in these countries, people that enter in, uh, into Lithuania and then go to us. It's education-related matters, uh, employment matters. Uh, it's a matter of choice on the person which country they select. Uh, Ukraine, to go to Ukraine without a visa, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland. Once again, I'll emphasize it is possible to go through uh, uh, the border, uh, the Polish border without a visa. Uh, the lot, uh, including the airport, the lot uh, company accepts people even without visas. 
Polish Polish airline. Okay, let's go to the questions and answers that have been uh, on QPOA session. There are, there's been a number of questions that have been forwarded. We have Alexander Kornichev from Vitebsk Courier. Vitebsk Courier, he asks, I believe this is about, do you uh, reject help? Uh, what is the percentage of rejections? Why does it happen? Okay, I can I can start answering and then pass the floor to my colleagues. Uh, the rejection rate is small, but we do reject. Formal criteria, uh, the, uh, the main the 20th, main the 20th and onwards, we can help them after that. We can consider fines that have been served before that time, but formally, we try to filter out the fines that, that have been uh, that have been issued after the presidential campaign. Uh, and we see, uh, well, the, 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 there have been isolated cases of fraud, of, uh, when people, crooks, try to get help, but uh, there's a very limited Boisole, amount. Boisole, Boisole Boisole has a similar, has a similar system. We don't even run separate statistics of rejections. We don't even run separate statistics of rejections. We don't even run separate statistics of rejections. We don't even Resignations for political reasons. Clearly, nobody is going to write into the labor records. So, video обращение, в котором рассказывает о том, что произошло с ним и какая ситуация с ним приключилась. Наша логика такая, что если человека увольняют за личную демонстрацию его политических взглядов, для него не составляет никакого труда покрыть их еще раз в этом виде. Бывают редкие случаи, когда человек пользуется возможностью получения помощи, скажем так. Не очень uh, честно, то есть not, утверждают, что вы уволили по политике, а потом, например, у нас была ситуация, когда занимательство с нами связался и сказал, ребята, что я вам сам донатил, и как бы, okay, я думаю, это guys, полная I'm your donor, ложь, что this, this guy, so this за несоответствие занимаемой должности. Это сложная для нас история, их, к счастью, немного, но есть ситуации, когда, например, подтирают у себя данные в трудовых книжках, выбивая свое время по политическим причинам, uh, and they, uh, they try to uh, show the code that they've been fired because of their political position. И кейсы, которые произошли раньше, в мае 2020 года, мы не рассматриваем. Есть большая проблема еще с релакантами, потому что достаточно сложно верифицировать случаи, когда человек выезжает фактически для того, чтобы реализовать свои экономические какие-то потребности, и далеко не всегда он действительно исследовался на родине, в том объеме, который в нашем понимании является достаточным для того, чтобы человек выезжал. Но тут всегда очень субъективно все, потому что один человек, Человек, который получил 15 суток, он будет очень One бояться, что его дальше будут преследовать, он сразу же уезжает. Другой человек получает раз за разом сутки штрафа и остается все равно в стране и продолжает участвовать в протестах. Вот. Неоспоримым для нас основанием в данном случае является уголовное преследование. Тут как бы вопрос. Вот. Так что задачи эти достаточно сложные, не тривиальные. Мы подходим к каждому. Uh, so these challenges are indeed, the vetting process is quite uh, sophisticated, quite challenging. We treat everything case, case by case manner. We try to avoid, or we try to help the person as best as possible. One thing I forgot. Recently we've had a question on repeated payments. Uh, well, because of the trauma, because of the injuries that people got uh, battered by law enforcement. So a person uh, received the funds, uh, they healed themselves, and then they, they went out on the demonstration and got beaten up again. So the, we don't have a consensus whether to pay again to this person or not. So what is the principle uh, that we operate by? If that person received the first injury payment and this there's another injury which is similar or smaller uh, to the to the one that uh, the person uh, was inflicted on initially we don't give uh, extra money the, there was one girl that was uh, beaten up uh, and then the second time her hands her hands were broken her, her arms were broken uh, when she was being arrested so we in that case we pay 
by help is a one-time fund. Uh, maybe we will change uh, this one-time payment, uh, once only payment later on. We have enough uh, to reconsider that. But again, if we pay every person $500 and there are 6,000 people, well, that's, uh, that's, that's not a net amount that we've been raising. Well, that's, the audibility is really limited for, for this. I'm not making much sense right now. Belarusian pounds or the UK, UK pounds need to be transferred into Belarusian money. That's, we're not losing five or ten percent, but the, we, we are losing a certain amount of money from the donations on the on the FX and the, for, on the currency conversion. And for this reason, we can reject people if they uh, came to us uh, repeatedly for medical payment. We did not uh, imagine that people would be beaten up twice. Although when, when, whenever there are severe injuries, uh, then we analyze this case by case, by case, by case and we'll probably change our policy. Uh, okay, I can say that we, have the, we operate by the same principle. We only render support to those who have been victimized after the events of the 9th of August. We've had isolated cases when people came to us with some pretty old situations. Our principle is this, advisory assistance, we do not turn down anyone. The priority is definitely, people prioritized are the ones that have been victims. If they require advisory assistance, or if people simply require uh, Assistance, they were not imprisoned and they, 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 no criminal case, no criminal litigation was launched against them. That person will get advisory assistance, but not the, not the money. Plus, there's another filter uh, that we have. We operate, we cooperate with other funds. Uh, we try, uh, we trust uh, the cases vetted, for example, by Imena fund. Everything is properly documented. Uh, they give the case, they refer a case to us, and we, we don't question that person twice. We simply help because we, we trust the vetting uh, by th other foundations so that we cooperate with. Uh, relocation people, reloc uh, relicants, uh, people who come to Poland, they don't know the language, they don't have the means to existence, we help them. If it's a family, then we increase uh, the amount of, amount of payment. When, whenever there are children, whenever there's a single parent uh, living with uh, children or there is a, there's a full family, we treat these cases with, uh, with more attention, more thoroughly. We also try to avoid these people ending up uh, quarantined uh, or ending up in refugee camps. We try to help them. It's not always the case. Not always we are, we are able to do that. Some people come to Poland without contacting us first, and they are either put on quarantine or they, they are already in the refugee camp. In that case, uh, our people simply uh, talk, uh, our lawyers uh, talk people out of this uh, faulty logic. When people come to Poland with a working visa and they are uh, offered at the border to file uh, asylum application, asylum or refugee application, uh, in that case, the, they simply uh, lose their work permits. In this case, uh, our lawyers, so for such cases, our lawyers advise that uh, you don't have to do that. Just come, come to Poland and work if you have a work permit, working visa. The amounts, we uh, coordinate that with our partners to have a level playing field. We don't help twice uh, normally, but again, we, uh, we are looking forward for that law to be passed, to, to be enforced. Uh, people with any visas entering Poland will be able to find employment. Uh, we try to find them uh, accommodation so that until that time they're granted the opportunity to work, they will, they will have place, a place to live. This is normally related to strike committee, to the people who have actually took a hit. Another, another point, it's people with uh, traumatic brain injury, with fractures, medical assistance required. In that case, we have an opportunity 
to quickly render outpatient assistance. Normally, these were initial cases uh, at the outset of our operation, but now that uh, the, the oppressive forces, the law enforcement of Belarus uh, uh, become more violent, so we have more and more of these cases. And in this, in the, for, for, for such cases, we try to cooperate with uh, the local healthcare uh, system. There are also Belarusian doctors uh, who have responded to our appeal. There's another point, psychological assistance. We have psychologists. Belarusians are built this way. They're, they normally turn down the psychological assistance, although it shows that they require it. Uh, it's, uh, the psychological trauma is seen in people. And they, we know that they require it. We know that they will benefit from this help. And it's difficult to uh, convince a person to use the psychological help than otherwise. I mean, people try to sort out their li uh, uh, living issues, uh, their uh, daily, daily routine issues. And then, uh, yes, uh, the guys have talked a lot. I'll elaborate quickly. We have a similar principle. The criteria is according to which we render assistance. 2.6 thousand applications, around 700 of those were administrative fines. Uh, people were fined because of the protests that they participated in. And uh, we forward these applications to funds uh, that deal with that. I mean, our fund does not uh, uh, deal with this directly. We refer these people. A second elaboration uh, to what the colleagues have said. We maintain databases, and that's an important point. When people uh, come to all the foundations, to all the platforms, we interact uh, uh, among each other, and we see that uh, people have been helped elsewhere. This, uh, if people got help from BISOL or uh, by help, uh, we consider the same case uh, if a person was fired uh, because of the civil stance, because of their uh, political reasons, uh, political outlook. If, if this is the same story and you got help from one fund, then we definitely take this into account. We would like to help as many people as possible, not to help uh, the same people uh, over and over again. All right, there's a question from Olga Simashka, Belarusian Radio Russia, to all the funds. Uh, what stories uh, of people uh, have impressed you the most, uh, without naming names? Andrew, Alexei, what stories impressed you the most of your beneficiaries? Yes. Alexei? Yes, I wanted to dodge answering this uh, question because, well, it's easier to say which uh, stories did not impress us or failed to impress us. I will not go too much into too much detail. It is indeed a very challenging piece of work that we're doing. Uh, uh, people that well, we've been we've been up and running since August 23rd. Well, everything that we've seen uh, is pretty much out of touch, out of line. It's 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 not compatible with normal society, with with decent society, the way it's decent law enforcement. The applications that we started receiving two weeks after the elections, uh, after. Uh, August 23rd, and there was a there was a surge in applications uh, around that time. Uh, those those were all extraordinary. What the riot police, what the Amon could do, the protesters, I don't even want to describe that, because when yesterday uh, uh, Kachanova the, said that there were no rapes uh, uh, among people, well, we have at least one case where a person is is uh, uh, prepared to publicly a test to, to, to what had been done to, 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 to them. So medical consults have, have, have seen, uh, have shown that in four cases there has have, have been actually uh, rape against, uh, against four protesters. And there is medical evidence to that. I don't process all the applications, but from the, from the applications that I've seen, well, who could have thought that uh, the law enforcement, the Amon, can actually rape people? 
well, there are cases like that. Nobody would have thought, but it, it is ha it's happening. People are labeled with yellow paint because they were deemed to be organizers of street protests. Well, I would never thought, I, I never thought this possible, but it happened. So I, again, I, I won't uh, no, go too much in depth answering this question because every case is coming our way. Yes, I'll support Alexei because all the cases coming our way are pretty much every, every time. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a lot of, it's a lot to take in for volunteers. These are stories, uh, tragic, uh, everyone, uh, everyone, every single story tragic in its own way. People who have been working for two decades uh, enjoyed their work, uh, they have to leave it. Uh, a variety of reasons uh, sometimes. К счастью или к несчастью, не знаю, большинство меньше работает с историями насилования, избиений массовых. Хочет больше с Я тоже подтверждаю слова Алексея по поводу того, что есть насилование. I will confirm that there, are, there is a case of a ray of rape on the one who was published. So, so the presidential administration here of Kachanova is, is bending the truth. Uh, uh, government lies every time they open the mouth. It's just something that we need to get accustomed to. It. They can only paint a beautiful picture. They can sugarcoat reality. We're uh, uh, trying to get us to flip the page. We will flip the page together with Lukashenko and with the names of the officials. Эта страница будет перевернута тогда. And once we're done turning that page, the country will live without any different life. What I'm impressed by is the people who agree with the words about the volunteers and said. Больше восьми больше восьмидесяти дней, если я все правильно считал, и это первый момент, способность людей. А второе это нас было несколько таких историй, когда человек публично, публично, публично вообще не сказал, что когда мы предложили ему помощь, что знали о том, что он уволился, он говорит, что я вообще донатил фонд, и сейчас как-то не очень логично мне из него получать помощь. Это логично для меня получить помощь. И вот этот момент тоже очень впечатляет. There are people that require money more than me, and it's, it's very impressive. I mean, people who have been oppressed against, they still believe that they are able to deal with that situation themselves. And more than that, they are also rendering assistance to the aid. They are acting as donors, not as beneficiaries, although they are fully entitled to be beneficiaries. Well, emergency mutual health uh, help. Well, there are surreal cases when people are fired because of their civic stance, but there are people uh, that are prepared to, to take this tough, tough decisions, uh, to make these tough decisions, uh, go from work. Uh, basically, uh, people uh, refused to participate in rigging the elections, uh, or knowing full well that they will be fired for that. Secondly, there was a situation about uh, com compared to foundations uh, working with uh, people who have been suffered because of violence. Uh, we are well. Our work is uh, a bit more positive. I mean, the, the, there are tragic stories, but there's less of that. There are tragic stories of families of individuals, but I rejoice at the fact that people are taking a, a weighted approach. They're able, they, they are willing to change their work and they find other people uh, willing to help them. So in this case, maybe our, our picture is a bit brighter than, 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 that, than that of our colleagues. Thank you, Elena. Vlad, in a nutshell, please, we don't have much time. I uh, would like to ask uh, voice a number of questions. Yes, I'll just uh, second what my colleagues have just said. I'll just add that the lawyers uh, that are processing these hundreds and hundreds of stories cases, uh, it, it is them who require psychological assistance. Burnout. There are people uh, that have been raped. Uh, there was a girl that was chained, actually, chained and raped. There's a, there's a guy, if you read the story, uh, it's like the DNR LNR, the Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republic, when the Omon people are uh, taking them to the basement, they're stripping, stripping them naked, uh, they uh, draw 3% on their chest, they, they, well, basically abuse. They force them to, uh, to, to, to sing the anthem of the riot police and so on. You realize that a person 
that underwent this kind of trauma, it's, it's very difficult to ask uh, help uh, from law enforcement who are supposed to enforce law, not, not uh, oppose against the law. In Belarus, it's possible. After 19, 1944, these cases were, were, were not seen in Belarus. Now we see them. And it's very painful to read about these cases. Uh, the BIPO uh, people, uh, Andrei Stapovich, other officers, uh, they are also considering these cases. All, uh, all this uh, documentation is going through BIPO. Uh, it is documented, it is recorded, including the, the, there, is, uh, there are video recordings uh, uh, of these uh, testimonies, of these witness testimonies, of witness accounts, uh, so that it can be used in litigation later on. Yesterday, there was an OSC publication for the Moscow mechanism uh, within the, and they uh, encouraged the creation of an international uh, legal body, legal uh, institution involving uh, legal prosecution of the, сейчас, of the perpetrators. Uh, I hope that the group, uh, witness accounts that we're collecting will be used uh, there. I'll also add there is a test that has been created. Uh, there are uh, colleagues that have been conducted in the war times uh, in Donbass. In the situation in which we are now, this is also a case that we are living through right now. That expertise will come in hand, unfortunately. We will build, we will rule the students Момент, videos, вот, uh, using the International Criminal Court guidelines, as we did uh, back in the Donbass uh, time. And we will also конечно, work uh, with the psychological and very difficult thing, so that the victims of violence made a public statement. Because there is this impression that uh, the government has already blurred uh, uh, the relevance of these issues that has mentioned. The tortures, particularly Да, еще нужно отдельно отметить, что внутри силовых структур которые являются партнерами Беларуси, для которых слово «закон» и «право» не являются пустым звуком, и они прямо сейчас работают на этом, они тоже внутри системы стараются собирать данные, чтобы они сохранились, чтобы они исчезли никуда, и по нашим данным, в том же МВД, например, сейчас в крюках люди уже между собой не разговаривают, что никто не может around the cooler. There is no cooler talk in the Ministry of Internal Affairs to avoid other people knowing what's going on in your mind. The system itself has taken a strong hit because of the things that happened. The people who were in the Ministry of Internal Affairs are quitting. The lawyers that have been implicated in some challenging political cases, they are in the system. And in my opinion, the biggest uprise or the biggest reluctance in the Generalist Prosecutor, то есть это те органы, которые сейчас наиболее неустойчивы с точки зрения подчинения власти. Но точно такая же похожая ситуация есть и в МВД, внутри МВД, внутри практически всех силовых структур, и они только внешне кажутся монолитными и полностью подчиненными Лукашенко, но по факту то, что там внутри сейчас происходит, это все то же самое, что и во всем белорусском обществе. Uh, things happening there are very similar to those happening in the Belarusian society, very same processes. Right, so we're running out of time, so the final question I'd like to voice uh, for every, for all the funds. We have Max Dmitry on next topic life. The question is, do people have enough manpower to process the applications and what bottlenecks do the funds see in their, in their operation? Okay, I'll, I'll start, unless Andre, yes, you're also letting me take the whole first. Okay, so uh, the manpower is sufficient. We have enough people. The number of volunteers is not too big. Those people that joined us in August, Nine or ten are still working, uh, the same kind of industry. Well, uh, we've had 1,300 applications uh, to become volunteers. In August, we are receiving those. Now, uh, well, uh, fewer than that, but, uh, but still, the trend is high. We are not expanding the staff of volunteers because we have over 50 people uh, working in various capacities with us. We can work, uh, we can expand the staff anytime we want. Our bottleneck at this time, 
frankly, is the uh, promptness of payouts. It takes time. Payouts take time. With, unlike BISOL, we have more uh, payouts that are not, not standardized. They could be from 7,000 7, uh, rubles. Uh, for injuries, we pay depending on the grade of injuries. Several thousand of rubles, potentially, depending on the severity of the trauma. The more severe the trauma, the more money. In this case, we proceed from the severity of the injury. Well, the criteria of the criminal code. Grievous bodily harm, otherwise, we, we can make more than 100 payouts a day now. We can, we can make 300 if you want to. 300 disbursements, 300 payouts. And I'll elaborate on Ed, what Edway has said to cut our oxygen, to cut our payments. So they don't just have to disable SWIFT, MasterCard and Visa. They will have to withdraw. They will have to t come and take all the funds that are physically uh, in Belarus. We don't, we don't have to get the money through the border. That's, that's what I would like to say. Stopping the disbursements. There's no way Lukashenko can do that. Apart from the fact that, well, the Northern Korea is a scenario, well, but that, that point is past. Bottleneck. It's not about uh, the number, the amount of money that we can raise within the country. It's uh, 200, 300 uh, people. We don't want to jeopardize those who are paying. Uh, for this reason, we are uh, limiting the payout amounts because the security of people, uh, safety of people who are making payouts, uh, we are prioritizing that. If uh, we are prioritize, if we were to select prompt payments or s safety of the people, we uh, well basically we can play around with that, but we prioritize the safety of people, of the those uh, providing the money. So we can accelerate the payout promptness uh, on the on one condition: the safety should be high for the people who pay out, because otherwise, uh, by uh, by help. Uh, will lose uh, the core of the team uh, that is essential to its... Uh, yeah, I would to add that I completely agree with uh, Alexei. We prioritize safety rather than promptness of payouts. This is the formula, this is the equation where the safety comes uh, first. It's the number one variable. Promptness of payouts, the time frame of payouts, the volunteers, uh, there's, there's uh, one more что объемы, с которыми работают вот такие волонтерские истории, они превышают там 100 тысяч долларов. Ну, как было. Сейчас мы имеем дело с миллионами оборотами, и это совсем другая логика работы. Здесь это уже логика работы крупной корпорации, которой есть свои внутренние процессы, есть свои узкие места. Одно из таких узких мест, например, это физическое масштабирование работы. То есть для того, чтобы нарастить количество волонтеров, которые занимаются верификацией, должны потратить определенное время на их обучение и на их верификацию. Uh, новых людей в процесс это всегда достаточно большой объем И вот у меня, например, process, есть выбор. Uh, или верификационная группа so будет заниматься проверкой кейсов, или верификационная группа будет обучать другую верификационную группу, которая опять-таки нужно отстроить и встроить в общем процесс. Uh, учитывая то, что для нас, опять-таки, напоминаю, работает эта формула, безопасность, скорость uh, и открытость, uh, то мы делаем сейчас uh, выбор в ту сторону, чтобы uh, наладить стабильный процесс, пусть даже это будет 100 тысяч евро в неделю, но это будет стабильная выплата 100 тысяч евро в неделю, okay, это будет стабильное покрытие сотни кейсов в неделю. Мы могли бы ускориться, но это значит, что в таком случае мы можем потерять устойчивость и столкнуться со всеми теми проблемами, которые я писал Леша, потому что это работа даже не в токсичной среде, это работа в условиях страны. Это внутренняя оккупация, по моей оценке, и те действия, которые сейчас совершаются в это действия 
абсолютно выходящие за рамки этого поля, поэтому мы очень дорожим не только нашим волонтерам, которые работают там, нашим жертвам. Наша задача сделать так, чтобы они не получили преследование но фактически, как вот Леша очертил ситуацию, да, действительно, выбить эту помощь невозможно, и сейчас власть делает все для того, чтобы очернить деятельность фондов. Мы видим централизованную массированную атаку сейчас на нашу репутацию, попытки выставить нас в негодном свете. Здесь, к сожалению, есть такая ситуация, что многие люди думают, что... То есть вот я сегодня подал заявку, а через там пять дней я уже Many должен Нет, к сожалению, так работать не будет. Uh, uh, средний срок обработки заявок uh, в фонде BySoul составляет uh, сейчас где-то около 15 дней, uh, до 15, uh, 15 дней. Uh, вот, и мы стараемся держать uh, приблизительно uh, вот этот баланс uh, еще по одной причине, потому что uh, сейчас мы заметили ситуацию, что система считается не только в силовой структуре, еще и в судебной системе. Буквально три минуты назад я прочитал сообщение одного из гомельских активистов, который сказал, что у него суд отменил штраф, который ему был присужден. Если мы будем платить слишком быстро, то мы можем столкнуться с ситуацией, когда мы просто делаем выплату, а его отменяют. То же самое со студентами, которые сейчас были отчислены. Вот, например, в ДМУ есть информация, что вроде бы начинают принимать обратно. То есть тоже такой вот момент. БНТУ, yes, да, то есть people, если мы будем бежать впереди поезда, скажем так, то тогда мы можем попасть в ситуацию, so когда мы делаем выплаты, train, о том, как их возвращать, we'll не возвращать, we'll то есть вот, так что в этом процессе, отвечая коротко, волонтеров достаточно, очень большое количество заявок, чтобы работать с нами, но, к сожалению, мы вынуждены отказывать, и пока мы не можем за менеджерить весь тот поток людей, которые хотят к нам присоединиться. Но мы над этим тоже работаем, как только будут отстроены все системы, то я думаю, что и для этих волонтеров тоже найдется какая-нибудь работа. By help and by soul can pay more. A bigger question is, how is that going to happen? This is the only bottleneck that, that, that we have. We can, we can do half a million per week if we, scale, if we want to scale up. We want to scale up even more. The big question is safety of the people. We don't want to jeopardize this uh, protocol. We don't want to, uh, to because of uh, rash decisions or because we want to, take, to make haste. The money is not the bottleneck, I can guarantee that. If I may, I would like to add uh, the particular nature of the Belarusian uh, Solidarity Fund. Uh, it's different. Uh, by help and by soul have a certain relation to the establishment of our, of our center, the Center for Belarusian Solidarity. Uh, people come to us for legal help. In most cases, they were helped by by soul and by help. And uh, since they end up abroad, uh, they come to our center and they will help, we help them. Whenever we have the possibility, we make payouts uh, through our private individuals uh, that uh, manage these cash flows. Something different that we can do here, unlike other funds. When a person uh, is at the border, they've already arrived and there's no way they can wait for two weeks we can render prompt assistance, very prompt assistance uh, to pay rent for their accommodation and meals uh, until that person receives the money from buy help or buy soul if they, if they didn't, if they hadn't uh, until then. So this is a big help in that, in that case, the cooperation. The mission, the main mission of our center is rendering legal assistance uh, to the people displaced or tem temporarily, or hopefully temporarily displaced from Belarus they had to leave temporarily uh, the country. Thank you, Elena. Well, actually, I won't take too much air time. Indeed, I agree uh, with the challenges uh, to expand the volunteer base, the volunteer staff, 
there's a peak right now, there's additional capacity, but to process uh, the applications. But again, it's very difficult to make forecasts, to make predictions uh, as to the growing trends of these applications. So we're trying to maximize or to, meet, to minimize uh, the time frame for application processing. The money, I believe that everybody is uh, speaking the same language and it's very clear why Belarusians uh, who are waiting for the money uh, they believe this process to be too lengthy to to be un uh, unjustifiably lengthy but again this is this is the safety of the of the process the safety of the people who help in the first place thank you very much thank you very much to all our speakers